by creating for them, and I quote, an upright spirit. Later, Moses requests that God create, and I quote again, create a pure heart and a spirit of holiness for them, which is clearly reminiscent of Psalm 51, in which the psalmist also asked God to create for him a pure heart and pleads with God, and I quote, not to remove your spirit of holiness from me. The creation of an upright spirit, a pure heart, and a spirit of holiness seem to be synonymous, each denoting the creation of a disposition to obedience, the possession of which would make dis disobedience impossible. God responds by saying that when in exile the people return to him, and I quote, in all uprightness and with all their heart and soul, he will effect the national spiritual transformation requested by Moses. And again I quote, and I shall uh, cut off the foreskin of their heart and the foreskin of the heart of their descendants. The Lord then continues, and I quote, and I shall create for them a spirit of holiness and I shall purify them so that they will not turn away from following me from that day and forever. That's in 123 in the Book of Jubilees. Parallel to the idea of an eschatological circumcision of the heart and those uh, of the creation of a spirit of holiness and God's purification of his people. Those, those two are parallel. The creation of a spirit of holiness is God's in planting a disposition towards holiness in his people. Similarly, purification is a removal of the disposition to sin. The result of God's creating a spirit of holiness uh, for the Israelites and his purification of them is that the people will henceforth keep the commandments, never again turning away from God. Now, it must be noted that uh, from the author's second century BCE point of view, this spiritual transformation was still future, being reserved for the eschaton, in spite of the fact that Jews had returned to the land long ago. The next text I'm going to look at is uh, Words of the Luminaries, 4Q504. Uh, the text entitled Words of the Luminaries is a collection of prayers, uh, one for each day of the week, dating from before the formation of the Qumran community in all probability. In the prayer to be recited on Friday, there is found a reflection upon the exile and God's subsequent mercy to his people. This mercy culminates in the spiritual transformation of the people. After he had poured out his wrath upon the nation, God remembered his covenant and redeemed his people from among the nations where they were scattered. Uh, in the view of the author, God was merciful to the Israelites while they, were, they dwelt among the nations in order that, and I quote, they might be caused to return to their heart and to return again to you and to heed your voice according to everything that you commanded by the hand of your servant Moses. According to this salvation historical reflection, while Israel was still in exile, God took measures to make future disobedience impossible. And I quote, For you have poured your spirit of holiness upon us to fill us with your blessings so that we would look for you in our anguish. In other words, God gave to the exiles a new disposition to obedience in order that their chastisement would not drive them even further away from him, but rather would lead them to repentance. Thus, one could argue that repentance is the effect of the pouring out of God's spirit of holiness upon them. Because they viewed themselves as in community with the exiles, with the result that they were equal participants in whatever befell them, those who recited this prayer could use the first person plural in describing this exilic event. They could use we and us. What is implied is that subsequent generations are likewise beneficiaries of the spiritual renewal described as the pouring out of the spirit of holiness upon the people, for it continues to be in effect among post-exilic generations. Whether the author of this prayer would see this promise as fulfilled of all Jews in his day or just a remnant from among them, however, is not clear. I turn now to the Qumran sectarian writings. The Qumran community understands its existence as owing to the eschatological mercy of God. Central to these texts is the assumption that the community represents the beneficiaries of God's present and future eschatological promises. One such promise is the granting of a disposition to obedience, sometimes called in the Qumran sectarian text, a spirit of holiness. 
Significantly, in the Kumon sectarian text, this promise is understood as both already realized in the present and yet to be realized in the future. Apparently, and I'm guessing here, it is realized in the present in a partial way, but will be realized more completely in the future at the visitation of God. I begin with the uh, rule of the community, 1QS. It is a composite document serving as something of a constitution for the Kumon community. It provides not only regulations for entrance into the community and the ordering of common life, but also provides some of the theological underpinnings of the sectarian movement. In the rule of the community, there are three references to spirit of holiness to consider. The first occurs in 1 QS 4, 18 to 19. At his visitation, the time of final salvation and judgment, God will put an end to the existence of deceit. That's what it says in 4, 18 to 19. It is said, and I quote, God will purify by his truth all the works of man and purge for himself some from the sons of men. He will utterly destroy the spirit of deceit from within his flesh. What is being described is the eschatological removal of the possibility of disobedience from his people, which they refer to as a spirit of deceit. The sons of truth may be generally righteous in the present, having a greater portion of of the spirit of truth, but they still have a share in the spirit of deceit. Only at the time of God's visitation will the possibility be eliminated altogether of disobedience. Now the means by which God will carry out this eschatological purging of his people is described in 1 QS 4.20 as his truth. This important but ambiguous term in this context seems to mean that attribute of God whereby he opposes and ultimately defeats the deceit infecting creation. Parallel to this, in 1 QS 4.21, it is said that God will purify man, understood generically, from all evil acts, and I quote, by means of a spirit of holiness, and that God will also sprinkle upon man a spirit of truth, like waters of purification. It seems that these three terms, that is, God's truth, a spirit of holiness, and a spirit of truth, are synonymous. Each denotes the means by which God will purify the members of this community at the eschaton. That is, each denotes an eschatological principle of obedience, the means by which God shall destroy, at his visitation, the very possibility of disobedience. That's the first text from uh, 1 QS. The second one is from 1 QS 2, 19 to 3, 12. Although 1 QS 4, 18 to 21, the, the one we just looked at, anticipates a time in the future when God would render disobedience impossible through purifying human beings by a spirit of holiness, in 1 QS 3, 6 to 8, it is said that a spirit of holiness is already present in the community, effecting repentance and atonement. This is a present manifestation of the eschatological mercy of God to the community. 1 QS 2, 19 to 3, 12, specifies what appears to be the procedure for the annual renewal of the covenant by the community in which all the members of the community must participate. In this context, the one who refuses to enter the, co the covenant uh, again is discussed. This one is said to be unable to repent in order that he might live. The same, and I quote, cannot be purified by atonement. Repentance is conditional upon entrance into the community, uh, which explains why the one who refuses to enter is said to be unable to repent. Repentance then brings atonement. Now, how entering the community, the ability to repent and obtaining atonement, how those three relate to one another, is further explained in this passage. The reason that atonement is denied to the one who refuses to enter the covenant is given as follows, and I quote, it is by a spirit of holiness of the community in his, that is God's truth, that he is cleansed from all his iniquities. It is by an upright and humble spirit that his sin can be atoned. So atonement occurs by means of a spirit of holiness, which is synonymous with an upright and humble spirit. The meaning seems to be that atonement occurs when a person enters the community and comes under the influence of a principle of obedience, which naturally leads to repentance, the turning from sin, uh, towards obedience to the law, properly interpreted. In response to this repentance, God then atones for sin. The idea that God responds by, or responds to repentance by atoning for past sin is not unusual in Second Temple Jewish understanding. 
The unique aspect of the Qumran sectarian perspective, however, is the idea that there is a principle of obedience at work in the community, effecting repentance, being a manifestation of the eschatological mercy of God. Uh, since it is called the spirit of holiness of the community, this principle of obedience is accessible only to those who enter the community. The phrase, in his truth, attached uh, to by a spirit of holiness of the community, should probably be taken to mean that the cause of the existence of this spirit of holiness is God's truth. Uh, that ambiguous term again, which seems to mean in this context God's eschatological mercy. The third text from uh, 1QS is column 9, uh, lines 3b to 4a. Uh, in this section, it is said that when established, the community will be, and I quote, a foundation of a spirit of holiness in or of eternal truth. Spirit of holiness seems to refer to the principle of obedience that God has granted to the community by means of which atonement ultimately is procured. Since atonement is a condition upon repentance, and repentance upon coming under the influence of this principle of obedience. Thus, the community can be described as a foundation of a spirit of holiness, insofar as this spirit of holiness, given by God, is responsible for the existence of the community in the first place. The community is a foundation consisting of a spirit of holiness. Without it, there would be no repentance. Uh, no possibility for the members of, quote, cleansing their way by separating themselves from deceit. Uh, the phrase, in or of eternal truth, modifying a spirit of, uh, a foundation of a spirit of holiness, uh, makes it unambiguous that this foundation has as its basis God's eschatological mercy, uh, expressed by means of the term truth. All right, now the next sectarian text that I want to look at is uh, 1 QSB, or Blessings. This text, known as Blessings, contain blessings, that's why it's called that, uh, that are to be recited after the visitation of God, when the sons of darkness and evil will have been removed from the world. For this reason, uh, these are eschatological blessings. Now, this time, the maskil is to bless, and I quote, those who fear God, do his will, keep his ordinances, and are strengthened by his spirit of holiness and walk perfectly. The blessings, in other words, will be directed towards those who obey God, uh, the members of the community, in other words. What is significant uh, for my investigation is that the members of the community, after God's visitation, are referred to those, uh, referred to as those who are strengthened by God's spirit of holiness. From the context, God's spirit of holiness seems to be an eschatological principle of obedience. That is, at the visitation, of God, the members will be able to obey God because they will have been strengthened by God's spirit of holiness to do so. All right, I now turn to uh, another sectarian text, and that's the Thanksgiving hymns. In the Thanksgiving hymns, there occur several references to spirit of holiness as a present reality in the life of the community. In some of these, it is clear that the spirit of holiness is a principle of obedience. A spirit of holiness is granted to the founder and members of this community, with the result that obedience becomes possible for them. Without this provision of mercy, obedience would be impossible since human beings are thought to be naturally weak and sinful. Since the community understands its origin and nature in eschatological terms, God's granting a spirit of holiness in the thanksgiving hymns should be interpreted as a uh, the fulfillment of his eschatological promise to make any future disobedience on the part of his people impossible. Of course, the community applies this promise to its own members and not to the nation as a whole. The first uh, text I'm looking at is from uh, 1QHA, column 8. In this uh, section, the author refers to being, quote, strengthened by a or your spirit of holiness. Following this, there occur three more infinitive constructs, and I quote, to adhere to the truth of your covenant, to serve you in truth with a perfect heart, to love your, and then the text breaks off at that point. And unfortunately, the text is full of lacunae, so that it's not clear how these three infinitive constructs relate to the previous uh, infinitive construct, to be strengthened by a or your spirit of holiness. 
It is probable, however, that being strengthened by a spirit of holiness is to be enabled to obey the law, which the three infinite constructs following express in different ways. A few lines later, the author adds, I know that no one is righteous except through you. On this assumption, he implores God, by means of the spirit that God has given him, to, and I quote, perfect your loving kindnesses to your servant forever, to purify me by your spirit of holiness, and to draw me near to yourself by your grace according to your loving kindnesses. The spirit that God has given to the author is doubtless to be identified with God's spirit of holiness. What is significant is that God's spirit of holiness is said to be the means of purification. The meaning probably is that receiving the, a spirit of holiness issues in repentance, which results in being purified from sin, since repentance uh, is a condition of the removal of guilt resulting from sin. Uh, the next uh, text from the Thanksgiving hymns is from column 15. Uh, a similar use of the, of the term spirit of holiness occurs in 1QH15, uh, lines 6 and 7. The author begins his hymn on a note of thankfulness. He says, and I quote, I thank you, O Lord, that you have supported me with your strength, that you have spread your spirit of holiness upon me in order that I might not stumble. God enables the founder to carry out his appointed task of leadership within the community against all opposition by means of his spirit of holiness. To stumble would be not only to fail, but also to sin against God. This spirit of holiness is a principle of obedience, a new spiritual disposition. This interpretation is confirmed by what the author says uh, in 1 QH 12, 31 to 32. And the path of man is not secure except by the spirit that God creates for him to perfect the paths of the sons of man in order that all his creatures know the strength of his power. In this passage, the spirit that God creates is the capacity for obedience imparted in a human being by God and is doubtless a synonym for the phrase spirit of holiness. By it, a person's way is made perfect, which is to say, they become obedient. In other words, a human being cannot obey God unless God first imparts to him or her a principle of obedience. In this way, it becomes known to all that God is active in enabling obedience, which is called the strength of his power. I now turn to uh, another uh, Qumran Sakarian text. And it is called the Barki Nafshi, or Bless O My Soul, and is 4Q 434 to 438. Five collections of fragments of a work that has been given the name Barki Nafshi, or Bless O My Soul, were discovered in Cave 4 at Qumran. What remains of the Barki Nafshi document gives expression to the idea of God as merciful to his people. 4Q 434, fragment 1, column 1 represents the beginning of this text. On the assumption of the sectarian or origin of this text, and I didn't give you any arguments for it because I created a shorter version for presentation, uh, this opening section appears to be a description of the beginnings of the community, uh, similar to what is found in the Damascus document, uh, columns 1 and 2, 1, 1 to 2, 1. Of significance is the fact that the author explains that God's mercy was manifested to the pristine members of the community as his spiritual transformation of them. And I, I quote, he circumcised the foreskins of their hearts. Uh, this passage is obviously dependent upon Deuteronomy 36, which promises that God will create, the, sorry, will, that God will circumcise the hearts of post-exilic Israel. It's also uh, found in Jubilees 123. It is also said that God, and I quote, has established their feet on the path, uh, which is an idiom meaning that God has so transformed them spiritually that they now live obediently. Finally, uh, God, and I quote, made darkness light before them. This is probably an allusion to Isaiah 42:16 16, which describes the eschatological transformation of Israel. The community is applying this prophecy to itself. In a section of the Barki Nafshi text preserved in the 4Q 
435, fragment 2, column 1, which is a parallel in 436, fragment 1, columns 1 to 2, this spiritual transformation is further described, probably using the phrase, spirit of holiness. The author says, and there's a, there's a gap in the first part of the sentence, so we're missing a word, something you have driven with rebukes from me and to put a pure heart in its place. Uh, which is very dependent upon Psalm 51.12, where pure heart stands parallel to the phrase uh, steadfast spirit. The author then continues, And the evil inclination you have driven with rebukes from me, and a spirit of holiness you have set within my heart. Now, the phrase spirit of holiness is reconstructed from Psalm 51.13. There's a, some evidence from the text, but... Uh, based on the fact that the author is using Psalm 51 uh, for his terminology, this, I think, is a valid reconstruction. In which case, the author is using the phrase, spirit of holiness, as a principle of obedience. Uh, in this context, then, uh, it is an eschatological principle of obedience because the author is describing uh, the founding of the community uh, as God's eschatological community. Now, in conclusion... In the passages examined, a spirit of holiness denotes an eschatological principle of obedience. I hope I've established that. If I haven't, I failed miserably. Uh, <laughs> expressed differently, it is a divinely granted capacity of repentance, which in some cases is said to result in atonement. In some of the texts, the granting of a spirit of holiness is viewed as yet to take place uh, in the future, the eschatological future to be more precise. Whereas in other texts, it is a present reality and uh, incipient manifestation of eschatological mercy. Defined as such, the term spirit of holiness is synonymous with the various expressions in the Hebrew Bible used to describe the means by which Israel will be spiritually transformed at the eschaton. Now, clearly not every use of the term spirit of holiness in Second Temple Jewish texts has its meaning. Nevertheless, this is a distinct use of the term and not to serve as a religious historical background or point of departure for understanding some of the occurrences of the term Holy Spirit uh, in the New Testament. That's it. We are definitely back on track time-wise, so uh, we have some time for some questions. Hedley, oh, I was just going to say, Hedley Hawkins must have left, but he really just moved <laughs> to another part of the room. Thank you, Hedley. Uh, the reference to the, um, the impossibility of disobedience, um, did they, in their life experience, realize that that was never really true, and that the spirit of holiness was indeed on the other side of the grave, or were they so naive as to expect uh, perfection from their adherence in this world, in this space? They never really asked that question directly, but I guessed, that was my guess at the beginning, I guess that in their view, that spirit of holiness, which is God's act uh, on behalf of Israel to help them or transform them from disobedience to obedience, took place in some kind of preliminary way. Uh, not, not to say that, you know, you could you were the same as before and after, but somehow in that community, God had done something, and entering the community brought you under the influence of that principle. That's a sort of a modern way of describing it. They didn't use that terminology. Which genuinely uh, transformed you. But we know from the various uh, legal codes in Kumon Sotarian texts that not everybody was perfect because they had all kinds of laws saying if you do this, this is what happens, and you can be expelled. Uh, so I'm not really sure what they, how they explain that. Uh, but they did, however, even believing that there was in the present a spirit of holiness at work within the community, they, they believed that God was going to do something at the end where he would forever remove the possibility of, of disobedience uh, through spirit of holiness again. So maybe you could say, again, I'm just kind of guessing here, I'm not even sure if they even asked this question, 
uh, of themselves. But if I were there and someone asked me, what do you think? I might have said something like, okay, it has begun. Uh, so there's a genuine change that takes place when somebody enters a community. But they're not perfect yet, and that's still future. But they, they, never, they never deal with that question directly. Thank you. Another question? Right here. Is there any attempt, uh, if you know, to uh, identify the spirit of holiness with the Holy Spirit? Uh, on the one hand, I, I see you referring to a, a concept of obedience and the Holy Spirit being the third person of the Trinity. There's a bit of a difference there. We're going from a concept uh, of obedience to a person. Right. Uh, was that community aware of that? Now, my argument is, uh, it, when I read uh, New Testament, or when I read uh, Kumar scholars and they interpret, you know, the, these various texts, they tend anachronistically to read Holy Spirit into the text, and so they see that phrase "Spirit of Holiness." Oh, Holy Spirit, and uh, that's God's, you know, third person of the Trinity. But from what I can tell, when they refer to the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of Holiness, uh, they didn't weren't referring to God's Spirit. They were referring to their own Spirit. So Spirit equals human Spirit disposition. Uh, that it was a principle which God sort of imparted, which caused them to become obedient. So nothing to do with the Holy Spirit, as we understand the Holy Spirit. But there's a connection with Paul, because Paul sees the Holy Spirit as precisely that, a principle of obedience. Uh, and uh, he takes it further, because for him, that principle of obedience is not just some kind of transformed human spirit. It's actually the Spirit of Christ, or the Spirit of God. So you can see, and this is why I think you should begin here, you can see how Paul takes it further, because very clearly for Paul, the spirit, of, the spirit of holiness is not just your spirit transformed. It is the presence of Christ within. Uh, and he uses various phrases for that. Uh, for example, in Romans 8, you know, he talks about the spirit of God, the spirit, the spirit of Christ, Christ. Uh, so he would agree, but he would probably say, again, I'm speaking, of, I'm speaking for Paul here, he would probably say, oh, you know what that spirit of holiness is? It's actually Christ in you. That's what makes you transform. And maybe if he were talking to him in a scene, and I guess, once again, I'm speculating, he might explain to him, that spirit of holiness which, uh, which you have spoken about is actually Christ within you. So, but again, it's, I'm just speculating to you. Question at the back. Can you determine uh, who wrote first? Yeah, Qumran. Yeah. yeah. By about 100 years or so. Well, thank you very much. We'll have an opportunity for more questions at the end of the afternoon. closing uh, at the end of the uh, final question period this afternoon. This one, Religion in the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, from that series, Studies in the Dead Sea Scrolls in Related Literature, uh, Professor Collins uh, is uh, one of the co-editors of this particular volume. Now you may see some of these other uh, uh, folk, like Craig and, and uh, Jonathan and Glenn, around many, many times to uh, get the opportunity for their uh, signature on the book, but this may be the uh, one of the very, very few times that you have the opportunity to get an autograph from uh, Professor Collins. So that's just a little word to the wise this afternoon. 